uh, it, we've birded a lot together around the around the the region and beyond. And um, I look forward to uh, to hearing his talk today. So, without any uh, further ado, um, we're going to have Ernie start. And just let everybody know um, this is going to be recorded, so that if you have um, um, want to see it again or revisit any of this, uh, and for those that uh, have registered and have missed it, uh, weren't able to come tonight, you'll get an email tomorrow with the link for that. And um, if you have questions, we're gonna try to hold them to the end, um, or so, but you can put them in the chat. And if something's kind of pressing or you wanted something uh, done, I'll, I'll interrupt Ernie with the question, but otherwise we'll try to hold them to the end of the talk. So um, with all that said, take it away, Ernie. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I, I got a camera at the suggestion of, of my wife, and she said, that sounds like it'd be something that you're interested in. And much like Dave, uh, if it kind of moves, there's an interest in it, whether it be a bird, a, a, a beetle, a butterfly, dragonfly, or whatever. So I, I took her advice and um, uh, bought a camera, and it wasn't long after that uh, I started taking pictures, some of them good, some of them not. That's still the case now. Some of them are good, some of them are not. But in bringing them up on the computer, I started to notice things that I hadn't seen in uh, real life. And I hadn't seen when I looked at the image that was on the camera for, for preview. So I thought that an, an interesting uh, uh, presentation might be entitled, what the camera sees because it's it's occasionally and many times much different than what we're seeing in real time uh, that's the picture of my of my quote camera uh, i don't have the long lenses uh, I, I have it's a sony cybershot uh, it has a 50 power uh, zoom lens which comes in quite helpful at times and um, I chose this particular camera at the suggestion of uh, Jim Sweeney, who some of you may know, he uh, lives on the South Shore for the most part. And I accompanied him on a, a birding trip to Texas. And this is the camera that he had and he had some fantastic shots and recommended it. And it's something that I purchased and uh, have been quite happy with. Uh, you can see by the looks of the camera, it's a little bit beat up a little bit. Um, it, it, it's a tool and uh, I try to take good care of it, but it has its nicks if you took a close look at it. So this is the presentation is, is my adventures with a camera during my birding expeditions. Um, it's another piece of equipment. It's starting to get a little crowded. I have a pair of binoculars. Um, I occasionally carry a scope when I am uh, out in the field. So the camera goes, I've got a, 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 an order. I put my binoculars on first. I put my, my camera on second. I sling that around uh, to my back and, and have it there when, uh, it, uh, when I need it. One of the things I'm gonna say though is right from the start, I'm a birder who takes photographs of birds, not a photographer who takes images of birds. In other words, the images aren't perfect. And uh, my prime reason for carrying the camera is enjoyment. And sometimes I get a good picture, sometimes I don't. Um, and as that point says, um, many times you find something that you don't expect. And every now and then I get one that's in focus and, and um, I, I may have one or two that are in focus. Sometimes the camera shows the unexpected and uh, something that you didn't see when you, you were viewing the bird or took the picture. Uh, this is a, uh, an image uh, of a king eider, drake king eider, uh, accompanied by a female common eider. And this, this particular picture was taken at Cape Cod Canal down in Bourne. A uh, couple reasons for the pictures. Uh, I guess I never noticed how deep the bird sank into the water when it was swimming. The current in uh, Cape Cod Canal is is pretty strong. And my recollection is that these birds were swimming against the current. And you can see that this bird's body is, is almost submerged. 
beautiful bird. Uh, I'm, I'm going to impart a few uh, uh, points during the during the presentation. Uh, this is my first one. Always carry your camera. Uh, uh, the best way to ensure that you're going to see a good bird is to leave your camera behind. And in this particular instance, um, a friend that I was birding with, uh, Glenn Duntremont, uh, we knew that this bird was in the area. We walked a couple hundred yards up the path, saw a big flock of eiders, quickly found out that the king eider was in view. So I had to run back a couple hundred yards to get to the car, get my camera, run all the way back and get some images of this bird. So king eider running pretty low in the water. Uh, eiders are, are very, very heavy birds, so it doesn't surprise me. But um, my expectation is that many of your birds will show a very similar posture when they're in the water and swimming against the current. This picture was, was taken uh, at the treatment plant in, in uh, Athol, and it was during March. Uh, this is an otter, which is not an uncommon sighting uh, around much of the area in the North Quabbin area. Uh, I didn't think anything about the picture. I took it. I know that the, the, the animal was there. When I blew up the picture on my computer, uh, I noticed that it was kind of frosted with ice, which I thought was an interesting picture. And it, this particular animal uh, was facing into the sun. You can see its eyes are closed and it's just kind of feeling like we probably would on a nice warm uh, spring day. And, uh, but generally we're not covered in ice. Uh, as many of you uh, probably around this area uh, have around your house, particularly if you have uh, hummingbird feeders. Uh, this is a ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, we've had probably several pairs around each summer, and uh, they come and perch on the, the uh, poles that we have the hummingbird feeders on. Uh, I have a number of pictures of hummingbirds, some males, some females, some juveniles. Um, this particular um, image uh, when I put it on the um, on the computer, showed the hummingbird with its tongue stuck out, uh, it, it, uh, which is kind of a cool picture. You can see the drips from the uh, the ring, the metal ring, which probably indicates it was it had rained recently or or it was a morning picture. I don't recall which. Uh, and you can see the beautiful um, ruby throat on this bird and the and a very nice iridescent coloring on its back and on its head. So very, very uh, interesting picture. And they are a lot of fun to watch. They're always fighting and they're always chattering. And sometimes you almost get one in your ear if you happen to um, uh, be gardening in, 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 the, in the perennial garden as I do occasionally. Uh, most of these pictures that you're going to see are, are, are taken locally. Uh, this particular bird is a, a raven which when Dave and I uh, were, were first uh, birding, uh, again, we won't say when, but sometime uh, in, in the uh, 70s, 60s, uh, ravens were a very, very rare bird, uh, but now they're, they're commonplace around the area. This particular picture was taken at the Tully Dam spillway and ravens have nested in the, in the rock ledges of the spillway for a number of years. Um, I took this picture, didn't think anything of it, thought, oh, here's, here's a nice picture of the raven. Uh, when I put it on the, uh, brought it up on the computer, I noticed that uh, this particular bird, which I assume is a female, she's incubating, and she had lined her nest with, uh, looks like foam or, or fiber that she had, uh, uh, probably picked up in any particular location. Nice, comfortable, soft nest uh, setting for um, for its uh, uh, nestlings. And typically, these birds will have four or five uh, birds, and uh, they all kind of fit in that one little nest. Uh, they typically are very, very quiet until um, mom or dad comes back with some food, and then they can get quite, quite uh, noisy. And uh, Right now, 
they're probably about ready to fledge. Um, they nest quite early. And uh, if you listen for a real loud scream, sometimes that is an indication that there are some young birds that are uh, in the area and they're calling for mom and dad to come feed them. Uh, this particular bird, everybody, again, another bird that, that back in the, in the 70s uh, were not to be found in the North Quabbin area. Uh, turkeys were reintroduced into, I think, the Peter Sam area locally uh, and uh, now have become very, very commonplace. Just about everyone can see one in their hometown, sometimes parading through their, their, their local neighborhood. Now, this particular picture was taken at the Daniel Webster Sanctuary in Marshfield. And uh, initially, when I looked at the picture, I thought it was, it was um, uh, uh, crowing or calling, big, big gobble. But if you look at the end of the beak, uh, you'll notice that, that the projection is not that its mouth is open and it's calling. Its beak is closed, and there's this little projection above it that looks like it, it has its mouth open. And this is called a snood, um, and uh, it's part of uh, the um, uh, the regalia of the uh, uh, of the tom turkey, and uh, it gets inflated and, and helps kind of in the um, in the courtship uh, uh, process. And you can see the nice long beard on this turkey. You can see the coloration, the, the light. Uh, blues and pinks and such, and the iridescent bronze colors on the uh, the wings and the back. So, here's a bird that, uh, if if we were talking back in uh, 1970, you would not have seen in the North Quabbin area. A uh, very poor picture, but uh, this is a picture of a black vulture. Uh, black vultures back in, in our beginning days were, were not found in Massachusetts, period. Um, within the last couple of years, there, there have been a couple of, of uh, locations that um, routinely uh, had black vultures. One was, was uh, down in the Blackstone Valley area in um, uh, kind of south central Massachusetts. Uh, uh, and they also were out in the, uh, the Berkshires. Within the last couple of years, uh, they haven't become common in this area, but have become, um, I would say, expected. Uh, Dave and I, uh, uh, Jeff Johnstone, another of, of our classmates, were on a bird trip to um, uh, down at the treatment plant one Saturday or Sunday morning. I don't recall which it was, but we looked up and uh, lo and behold, there were two black vultures. And this is a bird that we had been looking for for five, six, seven years um, and had, had not seen one. And that was our first sighting in the North Quabbin area. And its cousin, the uh, turkey vulture, uh, again, very rare back in our beginning times, uh, now very, very common. And there's a couple of, of big roosts, one up on Chestnut Hill Ave, Another one, if you if you really pay attention, when you go to Hannaford's Plaza, uh, the, there's a big roost that is out in the swamp that's to the left as you go in. And if you keep a, an eye out, you might see a black vulture. The reason I included this picture as poor as it was um, is in looking at the image, uh, I noticed that, it, that there were several of these birds that were circling and all of them were, were kind of dangling their legs as they were circling. Uh, and that's what this, this uh, image shows you. I'm not sure why they dangle their legs when they're flying around like that, uh, but uh, I have a suspicion that it might have something to do with thermal regulation. Uh, it might help to dissipate heat. Um, and uh, they are an all black bird. They have a black head, they have black feet, they have black wings. Uh, black plumage, so it's it's probably very easy for them to accumulate heat, and this might help them in dissipating some of that heat while they're flying around. Sometimes the camera sees what you didn't. Um, these kind of uh, a, a little bit uh, much the same as the prior uh, images, but uh, in some cases a little bit. 
picture of an inigo bunning, not, not an uncommon bird in our area. Uh, haven't seen one yet this year. I know that they've, they've kind of shown up and I tend to get them in my yard. Uh, a couple of years ago at the top of Mount Skinner, uh, excuse me, Skinner Mountain in, in Holyoke Range, um, we noticed this uh, male Inigo Bunning, and you can tell why it has the name Inigo Bunning, because it's a very beautiful blue color. But it happened to be uh, hopping around on the ground, uh, staying on the ground. Uh, it was close enough that I got um, an image, not a perfect image. Um, I'll tell you that um, uh, I'm not a photographer. Uh, with the skills of a Dale Monette, uh, a Rick Flamati, uh, a Jeff uh, Blanchard. Uh, theirs would be in focus, mine is a little bit fuzzy. But the thing that I noticed when I looked at this image on the computer, and it, it, it uh, kind of explained to me why this bird was, was kind of foraging on the ground. If you look carefully, you'll notice that it is sitting standing on the stem of a dandelion plant. And here's the, the dandelion, it's, it's obviously a little bit past. Uh, its seeds are starting to develop, but haven't yet um, uh, taken flight. And this inigo bunning was on the ground, stepping on a dandelion stem uh, and feeding on the uh, seeds of the dandelion plant. Uh, so there's a reason why this bird was on the ground. It just wasn't apparent to me uh, when I was looking at it through my binoculars. It wouldn't have been apparent to me when I looked at the image on the camera screen because it just didn't, didn't, didn't register. Uh, I call this the big beaks. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have a lot of evening grosbeaks. Uh, the one in the foreground is a male evening grosbeak. Uh, there've been hundreds of them uh, around in, in, in the local area. Uh, I live in, in Royalston. Uh, Royalston is, is typically known in, the, in the, the vernacular as the uh, Finch capital of the world uh, or of Massachusetts anyways, because we do tend to get a lot of evening grosbeaks in the area. Uh, the other big beak that's in this picture is a male cardinal. Uh, hate to say this, I'm sounding a little bit redundant, but back in our days, cardinals just weren't around here. Uh, they came um, uh, into the area probably in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, and now are, are, are very, very common in, in, in just about everybody's yard. Uh, if you have a feeder, uh, they typically come very early in the morning. They come late in the evening, uh, probably to kind of um, not present as big a picture to a predator. So I have two big beaks here. What am I, what, what, why am I including this picture uh, in the presentation? Um, they were cooperating. They, they both had uh, cracked a, a, a black oil sunflower seed. Uh, the Cardinals has it in its beak, ready to crunch. Uh, the uh, male evening gross beak has uh, has the husk of the, uh, of the seed kind of dangling from the uh, uh, tip of its beak. And just to show a little bit of interest in the picture, it, it's got some water that has dripped off the, from the top of the feeder onto its head. Uh, so it, it kind of created an, an interesting picture as far as I was concerned. Uh, I still have evening growth speaks uh, uh, present today. Uh, the rose-breasted gross beaks have, have arrived within the last couple of weeks. So what I'm really looking for is to get an image in the same frame of a cardinal, an evening gross beak, and a rose-breasted gross beak in the same picture. And I think that's kind of a neat picture. Uh, and I'll let you know if that happens. For those of you who, who are, are, aren't familiar with this particular bird, uh, it is a dick sissel, uh, not a common bird in our area or particularly anywhere in Massachusetts, uh, tends to be seen in the fall. Uh, this particular bird was, was seen in October 
Uh, it was in Middleton um, in a uh, kind of a community garden area. Uh, looks to be a probably a, a young male. So I took a couple of images. Again, not quite uh, totally in focus, but that's okay. When I blew up the image or when I looked at it on the computer, I noticed it had a big chunk taken out of its, its flank. Uh, so somehow this bird had some kind of a, an altercation or a collision where its flank feathers were uh, kind of torn out. And if you look carefully in here, you'll see that there's pin feathers that are, are, are starting to um, grow in, indicating that, that these feathers are, are being replaced. Um, and um, otherwise, can't say that I ever even noticed it when I looked at it through the binoculars. Uh, Plum Island, a uh, great place to be in the fall, particularly for shorebird migration. Uh, one of the, the kind of target species for people going to Plum Island is a buff-breasted sandpiper. And uh, there were a couple of them that were, were relatively close to us at Sandy Point. For those of you who've been to Plum Island, Sandy Point uh, is, is uh, kind of at the southernmost tip of Plum Island and uh, is a great area to, to view shorebirds, particularly in the fall. Uh, took this particular image of this bird, uh, looked at it on the screen, and if you kind of notice in the background here, uh, there's another one that's peeking out behind the vegetation. So we get a twofer, uh, and it, it sometimes is quite interesting to look at your images and uh, find out what is actually appearing there. Uh, Jeff Johnstone and, and I uh, were out in the Quab, and Jeff has a, um, uh, a boat that uh, he takes to go fishing, but we also uh, indulge in a number of um, excursions out in the fall during August when the shorebirds are migrating. And uh, a couple of years ago, we actually uh, saw and uh, got some images of a couple of buff-breasted sandpipers that were out on the, uh, the island that we refer to as Phragmites Island. And uh, these birds would not be visible other than by, by boat because they're rather small sandpiper um, passing through. Typically in the fall, we do occasionally um, um, see them here, but, but not certainly regularly. I'll, I'll pause here for just a second. Um, for those of you who, who use a camera to try to get images of birds, you'll sympathize with, with, with um, my statements here. Uh, birds very rarely stand still. Uh, they're always moving. Uh, slightest movement when, when you're taking, uh, you push the, the button on the camera, uh, is going to result in a uh, typically a, um, a slightly uh, out of focus image. I know a little bit about my camera, but I'm not a camera um, buff. So I kind of set it on its, its standard settings. I take the picture. I know I could fiddle with it and, and come up with uh, faster shutter speeds and everything, but then I'd probably miss the picture. Uh, I know that Rick Flamati is, is, is quite adept at uh, capturing these images of flying birds, and you'd swear they were sitting still. Uh, I don't have that, um, that capability, so you have to put up with some of these, uh, these pictures. Uh, I have not included any of the pictures that um, uh, I've taken when uh, I, I've kind of found the bird, which is a, 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 a trial for me sometimes uh, looking through the, um, uh, the camera. I finally get it. I adjust the focus a little bit so that I can enlarge it. And by the time I press the button, uh, the bird's gone. So I have a blank image or I have a picture of its feet. I have a picture of its blurry wings. Uh, and I find those, I didn't include any of them in here, but I always kind of laugh at myself when I see those pictures. Very blurry picture, but uh, I included it because it, 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 it uh, kind of showed or shows um, that this particular bald eagle uh, in flight it was taken down at the honeypot 
area uh, in Hadley. Uh, my wife, Linda, and I were, were, were driving down there in the spring, uh, noticed this, this um, uh, bald eagle was sitting at a big cottonwood tree there. We were observing it and it looked as though it was kind of picking something um, at its feet. And I, I, I initially thought that maybe it had a fish or some kind of food that it was picking at. Uh, it took flight. Um, I was fortunate enough to get it in the camera, which is, is, is a chore for me. Uh, clicked the camera. I got a, a blurry image of it. But when I looked at this bird on the computer, I noticed that um, it wasn't picking at food in this tree. It was kind of snapping off uh, some small branches uh, that it was taking to carry to its nest. So this particular bird was taking uh, uh, this stick or these, these small branches to its nest uh, to a known location there um, in the honeypot area. Um, and this is not the first occasion where I've seen birds carrying uh, nesting materials uh, that sometimes is, is a little bit obscure. Uh, this is uh, for the for the um, th This particular picture of is is of a common wood nymph. Um, I was walking uh, uh, to my house one summer, noticed this uh, butterfly was kind of hanging from the um, uh, one of the flowers. I think this is a. a, a um, a gooseneck loose strife, I, I don't recall, uh, was staying very, very, very still. And you can tell it was staying still because this picture is kind of in focus. So I clicked a bunch of images, clicked a bunch of images, thinking, boy, did I get lucky with this particular bird. Um, I walked around to a couple of other areas, uh, came back maybe 10 minutes later, looked at this in the, in the location where this butterfly was, was uh, situated, noticed it was still there. And I began to suspect that something was not quite right um, with the butterfly. Uh, I'll, I'll let you pause for a minute to try to figure out what's in the picture that, that the eye didn't see, but the camera picked up. If you look carefully, and I'm gonna back this picture up. This is a kind of an enlarged picture of a, an insect called an ambush bug. And an ambush bug, uh, as its name implies, kind of lies in wait and um, catches other insects, such as uh, butterflies, bees, things of that nature. And if you look up at the top here, you can see this ambush bug uh, it has his antennae, its eyes. You'll notice that it's got big, big forelegs. And it, the reason that this butterfly wasn't flying away and wasn't moving very much is because this ambush bug had clasped onto this uh, butterfly and um, was, they, they inject a, kind of a, a fluid, of, um, um, a chemical that paralyzes the, the uh, insect and it sucks the juices out. So here's something that beautiful picture of a butterfly and here's on a piggyback view of the ambush bug. And here's what the ambush bug looks like from above. Uh, if you look at it carefully, very, very uh, interesting pattern. Uh, tends to make it very camouflaged if you happen to be seeing it on plants. And they're actually a very common insect if you, if you take the time to look at some of the flowers uh, that are around your area. Visited my, my brother, Peter, uh, who lives in Virginia now, uh, a couple, two years ago. And we, we did a uh, uh, mid-April birding trip, which I found um, uh, ex extraordinarily uh, uh, satisfying. Uh, we saw a lot of good birds. Uh, we had a good time. Uh, this particular picture or image is of a marble godwit. Godwit is a kind of sandpiper. Uh, one of the largest ones that we have around here. We typically would not see them in the North Quabbin area. 
but usually there's one or two that show up on the coast, particularly on the Cape and occasionally at Plum Island. They have a big upturned beak. Um, and there were a lot of them down in, in, the, in the Chesapeake uh, Bay area. Um, we took the image and, and really uh, didn't notice anything different about it until I um, viewed it on the screen. And if you look at this particular individual right here, it's got a big bulbous uh, area on the top of its beak. Uh, that's not normal. Uh, just some kind of an imperfection in this particular bird. Uh, it uses its beak to probe into the mud and uh, come up with things like uh, sandworms and, and other uh, creatures that happen to be lurking there. And uh, very, very common down in the, uh, uh, the uh, at Chesapeake area. This was at the Chincoteague uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And we saw hundreds of them here at, at that particular spot. Uh, local uh, image taken on one of uh, Jeff's fall uh, birding walks. Uh, I'll mention uh, Jeff, many of you probably know Jeff. Uh, Jeff probably has led more field trips uh, for the Bird Nature Club than anybody else. Uh, he typically leads probably a half dozen spring trips and we're in the middle of those uh, spring local birding trips now. And he does the same thing in the fall. Uh, uh, very knowledgeable, enthusiastic birder. Uh, if there's a bird to be found in the area, Jeff is gonna find it. Uh, this particular bird was uh, uh, imaged or photographed on one of his trips down at the Cassis Meadow uh, Conservation Area off of, of um, uh, Pinedale Ave. And it is a, uh, a yellow-billed cuckoo uh, there is such a bird as a cuckoo. Uh, two types are found in this area. One is a black-billed cuckoo. Uh, the other is a yellow-billed cuckoo. Uh, typically, yellow bills are a little less common uh, than the black-billed cuckoo. If you look carefully at this particular bird, you'll notice that its lower mandible, its lower beak is yellow. Uh, has a nice uh, kind of uh, pale eye ring. Uh, if it was a yellow-billed cuckoo, this beak would be kind of a darker color, darker gray. Uh, the eye ring is typically red. Uh, this particular reddish uh, coloration in the, in the primaries is, is a good feel mark for yellow-billed cuckoo. And although you can't see its entire tail, these big white tail spots are, are uh, uh, a good identifying uh, feature of the yellow-billed cuckoo. Uh, took the picture or image of this bird, which was relatively close. Uh, did pretty good focus, if I must say so myself. But when I put it on the screen, um, I noticed it had something in its beak. And you can see it here. I had some of these blown up uh, as separate images, but they were very blurry. So I thought they were kind of distracting. So I, I deleted them before the, the presentation. But it has a, a, a caterpillar in its beak. Uh, both cuckoos feed on, on caterpillars uh, as their primary food source. They've been relatively common around here for the past couple of summers. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with gypsy moth uh, moths and gypsy moth caterpillars, um, they have been in a boom cycle the last couple of years. And because there's a big food source, uh, there's birds, there are birds like the cuckoos who um, are taking advantage of that. More food means more nutrition, uh, more young are born, and um, that helps the, uh, the numbers of cuckoos to, to increase. So uh, yellow-billed cuckoo, um, uh, interesting bird, uh, and, and it does uh, call and, and has the um, uh, call that says cuckoo. This image taken on the same day, uh, probably about 10 yards from that yellow-billed cuckoo. In fact, this image came first. Um, again, not a particularly great picture. Um, one of the frustrating points in, in um, taking images, uh, these cameras are, are kind of self-focusing. Um, you can blow them up or you can, you can zoom in on them. Uh, tends to focus, my experience is, 
it focuses on the thing just in front of what you're looking at um, and uh, take some practice to get a better image. So you notice that this uh, stem of this uh, shrub that it's in, I think it's a grapevine, uh, is in pretty good focus and, and, the, and the image of this bird uh, is a little less so focused. Um, interesting sparrow, uh, for those of you who are, are familiar with uh, some of our local birds, this is a sparrow. Uh, doesn't show it quite here, but it's got a big beak. And it's one of our, our more uncommon sparrows, very attractive sparrow. Uh, we see them occasionally in the spring, more commonly in the fall. This is a Lincoln's sparrow. Uh, it doesn't show it here, but it's got some very, very fine streaking, uh, kind of a grayish uh, okra uh, coloration in, in the uh, facial pattern. Um, got the image, showed it on the screen, and lo and behold, I found that um, it had it had it had uh, breakfast. It it seems to have a uh, some kind of a scarab beetle that it has in its beak. Um, looks like it's going to have an interesting time getting it uh, down. Uh, no doubt that it it uh, kind of crunched it up a little bit and swallowed it. So this um, Lincoln Sparrow had some food. Uh, I didn't see that, but the camera certainly captured the image. One of my favorites, particularly in the spring, uh, relatively common around here in the spring, particularly, this is called a yellow bellied sap sucker. Uh, if you heard its name outside of, and you weren't a birdie, you probably think that somebody was pulling your leg. Uh, in the spring, particularly the males, this is a male yellow bellied sap sucker. It's got this yellow tinge that kind of goes to the belly. So um, it, it, you weren't imagining things when you heard the name. Uh, this particular bird is a male yellow-bellied sapsucker. It's got this red crown. It's got a red throat. Um, and yes, they really do sip sap. Uh, if you look closely at this image, you'll see these little divots here. They're called wells. And the sapsucker, this particular tree is a uh, sugar maple tree. And they arrive typically in, in early April. Uh, food isn't particularly um, easy to come by. So they will drill all of these little holes. Uh, the sap is running, so the sap will come out uh, and, and accumulate in these, these wells. The uh, woodpecker will sip the sap. But the other thing that it gets for a food source is insects, early insects are attracted to the sap as well, because as you know, um, maple uh, sap has sugar in it. And uh, so the insects are attracted to the wells. The insect or the um, sap sucker feeds on the insects that are coming to these, these wells. A very attractive bird. This, um, I have a lot of fun in the spring on the deck that's off the back of our house. Uh, I sit there particularly in the afternoon when the light is great. One of the things you discover uh, when you're starting to take pictures of birds is that uh, the light is either your friend or your enemy. Uh, if it's coming in from the right direction, you get some nice vivid colors, uh, you get some nice images. If the light is not with you, all you get is a black blob. One of the, the things that I'll say about uh, um, uh, images. I don't do Photoshop. Uh, the only thing I really do with my pictures is I crop them um, sometimes, and I may lighten them or darken them a little bit based on what the, uh, uh, the picture looks like. I don't uh, change colors. Uh, what you see is what you get. So here's a nice male sapsucker. Here is a female sapsucker, not on the same tree, but very close to it. Uh, female sapsuckers have kind of that same yellowish tinge, but it doesn't tend to go toward the belly. Um, if we were in a group, I'd, I'd wait until you told me what the difference was, but since I can't tell what your uh, reactions are, what you're seeing, uh, a female sapsucker has a, a reddish crown and forehead. And you'll notice here that it has a white throat. So uh, this tells me that it's a female. 
But that's not the thing that I put the picture in uh, or the image in the presentation for. If you look a little bit to the right, I never saw it, but when I looked at the image on the computer, you'll see in this particular sapling that's next to that tree, lo and behold, here's a cocoon of a large uh, um, moth, and my I believe it's a Cecropia moth caterpillar. I never knew it was there, um, and just happened to see it when I was viewing the image of this yellow-bellied sapsucker. Saying on um, sapsuckers, uh, take them from the deck. I, I may come up with a presentation uh, images from the deck. This is a yellow-bellied sapsucker also. Uh, but the thing that you'll notice is that it has a black crown versus a red crown. And this is a, a rather uh, unusual rare uh, color variation of the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Uh, and it happened to, I didn't notice it when I took the picture. It was only when I viewed it on the computer that I noticed it was a different color variation. And just so you can see the two together, here's the black crowned one and here's the red crowned one. Haven't seen the male yet. This particular one has a white throat, so it is a female. Uh, driving home uh, one late March day, uh, coming up Chestnut Hill Ave, noticed a couple of big black birds sitting in a kind of a, um, a rather ragged looking ash tree. Uh, it was right next to the road, close, which means that um, my images have a chance of being in focus. I uh, took a couple of images. This is of that uh, uh, a black vulture that we saw earlier with its feet dangling. Kind of an ugly looking bird, uh, black head uh, without feathers. Um, the uh, uh, turkey vultures have a kind of a bright red head without feathers. And the thought is they, they are a carrion feeder. They feed on dead things and thought is that that helps uh, kind of keep them uh, cleaner when they're kind of uh, chewing into uh, carcasses and, and uh, doesn't accumulate some of the waste products that might be detrimental to its health. Uh, that's not the reason the picture's here. If you look closely, when I, I kind of put the image on the computer, um, it had a big carbuncle on its lower leg. Um, not know what that, don't know what that means. Don't know how common it is, but here's something that the camera saw that I certainly did not. Uh, I don't take pictures of, of, of only um, uh, birds. Here's a beetle that I noticed up in the Iverson um, um, uh, sanctuary that's in, in uh, Warwick. Uh, this particular beetle is an elderberry borer. Uh, very attractive, rather large beetle, uh, kind of a, a blue iridescent back, uh, bright orange, yellow, uh, kind of uh, upper part of its, of its um, uh, wings. Uh, for those of you who are, are plant uh, uh, aficionados, you'll notice that this is in fact uh, elderberry. And uh, I didn't really notice until, I know, I know that the, the, uh, the uh, insect was, was feeding or, or was kind of diligently on this particular plant. Uh, when I looked at it on the image, I noticed that it was eating. And you'll see this nice little uh, area that's kind of um, kind of chewed out on the, on the elderberry uh, bush. So uh, interesting picture. And the camera saw what I did not. Uh, poorly focused. Uh, I call this my Pierre uh, uh, flycatcher. This is a willow flycatcher. Uh, that is down, uh, was picked, image was taken in the uh, sewage treatment plant. And when I looked at it on the computer, I, it, I noticed that it had a butterfly or a moth, kind of gives it that, uh, that real French look. Uh, and uh, they nest in that area and this was bringing food to its young. This was a, a, a good winter for winter finches in the area. Uh, this is a, an image of a, um, a, um, a pine grosbeak. This particular one, I believe, is a female. Uh, rather large bird, big beak. Uh, and if you're looking for it, you you uh, look for crab apple trees, uh, which provides 
its food source. They come down here during the winter, they're typically further north. When the food supply is short, they come down looking for food. Um, most people think that they're eating the crabs. Uh, and, uh, but what they're really eating are the seeds that are within the fruit. So you can see here where it has uh, nipped a nice little uh, slot out of the, uh, the berry, has eaten the seeds and really discards the fruit. And you can see them kind of scattered all around the bottom of the tree. And that's in fact, one way that you know that they're there as you have all this debris at the bottom of the tree. Um, the uh, New England Equestrian Center in Athol called Nika uh, up off of Pleasant Street, a nice area to, uh, to take a walk to, to view birds. Uh, I was walking along a trail there, uh, a bird flew up from my feet, uh, which I knew was an oven bird. Uh, I've learned that if a bird comes up from your feet, it's probably acid. And uh, I looked carefully, and an oven bird is called an oven bird because of the type of its uh, nest that it makes. It nests on the ground. It makes this kind of oven-shaped nest. Um, and uh, I took the image, saying, oh, there's a nice picture of an oven bird nest, which I, I can't really say that I'd seen one before. Uh, but when I looked on the computer, uh, I noticed that you can see very faintly right here. Here's a picture, an image of a baby oven bird. You can see it's uh, the, the gape uh, outline of the, of the mouth. You can see its beak and its head, and it was waiting to be fed. Uh, I quickly uh, backed away and let uh, the parents uh, kind of attend to their young. And for those of you who don't know what an oven bird looks like, here's a picture of an oven bird. It is a kind of warbler, uh, feeds mostly on the ground. And as Dave, I think mentioned earlier, uh, they are very, very common in our woods. And uh, they've been, they, they have their call, which is called teacher, 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 teacher. And um, so they're a ground nesting warbler, interesting bird. Sometimes the camera memorializes what I call artistic images, not necessarily, and I'm gonna go through these very quickly because I know we're getting along in time. Uh, some purple martins uh, at the Daniel Webster Sanctuary in Marshfield. I took the picture. The background when I looked at the image was very pretty, uh, kind of mottled reddish gray. And, and these were uh, red uh, maples that were in bloom in the background. And this is a female martin, male martin. Uh, Phoebe, uh, picture taken at uh, the Eagle Reserve in Royalston. I didn't know it, but talk about uh, symmetry here. We've got a nice branch that is overlapping the shape of the Phoebe and the Phoebe is, is stretching its wing. Uh, warbling Vireo image taken at the treatment plant. Um, took the image, blew it up, and little did I expect that I've got I've got spider webs, I've got little drops of, of, of um, uh, dew that are kind of uh, showing up on the image, making a very attractive, uh, special looking picture. Horned lark, um, image taken uh, at first encounter beach uh, on the Cape took the image and, 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 and looked at it on the, on the computer and all of these beautiful uh, russet colors with the silvers uh, con contrasting nicely with the yellowish uh, throat of the lark and, and the other colors and its plumage. Very, very poor picture, but um, again, artistic um, in the North Orange uh, uh, Wildlife Management Area, there are a number of um, uh, great blue herons that are nesting there. And these two particular birds are courting. It's a male and female. Um, and uh, kind of an interesting picture showing uh, some nice shapes and, and kind of some nice behaviors as well. Uh, blue jay, again, taken uh, from the back deck. We have some Fasithia bush. Uh, this particular one was in good light, afternoon light. Uh, and it's pretty much in focus too. 
Cape May warbler, uh, not that common around here. Uh, this particular image was taken uh, at the treatment plant. This is a male. Uh, hermit thrush uh, taken uh, at the uh, Women's Federation just a couple of days ago uh, and uh, characteristically showing its, its tail cocked. Uh, you can notice that the rufous tail, which is a, um, a field mark of hermit thrush, um, a very, very uh, a pretty song and a resident around here that, that breeds relatively commonly. Picture, uh, I'm not sure if, if many of you recognize this, but it's a larch um, uh, formation of the cones. Uh, so that the foliage is just coming out and these are the will ultimately be the cones of a larch. These were taken in Maine, but they're, they're also found in some of our areas such as the um, um, Harvard Pond area that, that's in, in Peter Sam. Uh, nice handsome looking uh, laughing gull uh, taken in Virginia. Uh, I didn't really, I like the picture because it was a nice background, a fluke. And a look at the picture, and he's, he's obviously been dabbling in the mud. Never know when you're going to come upon a good uh, photo opportunity. Uh, this particular fox, uh, uh, gray fox, was was up on uh, Skinner Mountain. It, it's not a very old fox. Uh, it was all by itself. Um, we walked by it, and it never even noticed that we were there. Um, so. Uh, picture taken, one of the few of mine that are in focus. Uh, it was close and kind of a cute picture. Common bird, almost ignored it. Uh, these two mute swans were flying by uh, and uh, Dana Webster a couple months ago, not in particularly in focus, but, but uh, talk about uh, artistry. There are actually two birds here. And if you look uh, carefully, here's one, uh, here's its wings, here's the other with its wings in the background. So kind of a, a pretty picture. This is a, um, um, a bobolink uh, in the fall. And this is what they look like in the fall. The males lose their colors. Uh, artistry, we've got some nice yellow um, uh, evening primrose. We've got the yellows and the browns of the, of the, um, uh, the bobolink. Uh, so, this was taken actually on the same day as that dick sizzle. Can't have a, uh, uh, a show uh, of, of nice images without a sunset. Uh, this is, was taken at the Chicos Mountains in the uh, Big Bend National Wildlife, Wildlife Refuge, um, uh, National Park actually uh, in Texas on that, uh, that trip that I took out west. A very, very beautiful picture. Camera captures attitude, um, uh, red-winged blackbird kind of showing its stuff, taking a great meadows, where it gets its name, red-winged blackbird. Uh, who, 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 who wants to know? Uh, here's a yellow rumped warbler. Uh, when we were first birding, this was called a myrtle warbler. And sometimes I always uh, I kind of fall back onto the old names. Uh, but here's a nice male um, yellow rump warbler, and you can't see it, but it does have a yellow rump. Kind of a funny picture as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is a, uh, a broad wing hawk. Uh, take a look at its, the look on its face. I took the picture. I knew that the Oriole was here, uh, but I, I, I never could have imagined the look on the uh, hawk's face. It's kind of like, well, what are you doing here? Uh, here's our, our, um, our elderberry borer kind of looking at, at, at me over its shoulders saying, well, what do you want? One of my favorites locally here, uh, Carolina Wren. Uh, I've said it uh, probably half dozen times now, uh, back in our early days of birding, uh, this bird was not present. Now it's very common and talk about an attitude, the tail's always up and it is always looking for uh, that. Our tree swallow, uh, male tree swallow, again, kind of giving you that, uh, that leery look. 
black and white warbler, giving you that look. Uh, this picture was taken about two days ago out of our, our back window. Uh, we have a bear that comes through occasionally. Um, and uh, it's, it's like, yeah, you want me to leave? Sometimes a camera documents unusual sightings. Um, this particular image was taken at the Eagle Reserve in Royalston a couple of years ago. Uh, these are sand hill cranes. Uh, this particular, uh, they're not all in this picture, but there were 10 of them. Uh, and it was one of the largest concentrations of, of um, uh, cranes that were, were, were ever seen in this area uh, during late March. Uh, Dale Manette got some nice pictures of it. Uh, this was a uh, kind of a, ni a nice documentation because otherwise somebody probably wouldn't believe that you had that many. Uh, bird that I saw last year uh, in Royalston. Uh, this is a clay colored sparrow. Fortunate enough to see it, get a blurry image but it did document uh, that this particular bird was present around here. They're not very common at all. As its name implies, red-headed woodpecker, both the males and the females look exactly alike, so you can't tell them. Uh, this particular bird was uh, seen at the Nika site around the, the uh, uh, pens that, that they uh, show the horses. Uh, Jeff Johnstone and I were, were uh, uh, Jeff had, had made a couple of bluebird houses and we were installing them at the location and happened to notice this particular bird uh, that stayed for about an hour or two. We, we, we got some nice images and then it left. It was a one day wonder. This particular image, uh, uh, credit goes to Rick Flamati. Uh, these images are of a, a female ring neck duck and young ducklings of ring neck duck. Ring neck ducks are, are very, very common here in the spring migration and the fall migration. Uh, this particular uh, uh, image documented probably the, the third or the fourth record in Massachusetts of nesting ring neck ducks. Uh, and it was, it was quite a, um, uh, a, uh, an exciting time uh, I found them earlier in, in the uh, summer. I asked Rick to uh, uh, come out with me uh, to try to document that. We each got in kayak out there. My instructions to Rick um, was that if I tell you to take the picture, please get a good image of it. And uh, Rick more than uh, came through got a nice picture of the female and an image of the uh, little duckling. So, and they've actually nested there last year again. So that's two out of the last three years. Um, I'm gonna back up just one bit and we've only got a couple more slides. I uh, hope you, you've been very patient. Um, the camera has become a, an important uh, tool to document unusual sightings. Uh, if you go back to the, the 1800s, early 1900s, uh, most people documented bird sightings by shooting them. Uh, Audubon was, was um, a famous uh, bird artist, but most of his birds were shot and then um, drawn. Uh, in the 30s, there were some uh, laws that were passed that protected migratory birds. Uh, Raj Tory Peterson came up with one of the first uh, 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 very usable field guides in the mid 30s. Uh, shooting birds became uh, um, less acceptable because there were field guides that allowed people to identify birds with, with proper documentation. Uh, with the advent of, of the camera, uh, some of the, the experts have kind of reverted to um, having to shoot the bird in order to have the sighting be accepted. So now we're shooting with a camera versus a gun. Uh, we've come up with some very unusual sightings in Massachusetts, uh, but I make the point that uh, sometimes you can go a bit far. Uh, or I mentioned Glenn Dontremont. Uh, he and I were birding up at uh, Plum Island uh, a couple of years ago, in, and in July there was a snowy owl 
uh, that was perched on the top of a uh, telephone pole. Uh, Glenn took a, a cell phone image. I didn't have a camera at that point. Uh, we submitted the sighting to eBird, which, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, to this date, uh, the, that sighting has not been accepted by the person who reviews the sightings. Um, to me, there's not much you can uh, confuse a uh, snowy owl with, but um, we haven't submitted the, the, the picture of it to document it, which is kind of sad. Occasionally, the camera uh, consents to a little whimsy, as I call it. Uh, I, I'm always on the lookout for kind of funny sightings. Uh, here's a, a face in a tree. Uh, here's a dinosaur. Another face in the tree, kind of a, a really gnarly looking um, a monster, an eye, big cheekbones, nostrils, jaw. Uh, here's our little face, a uh, piece of uh, pegmatite. Uh, with some, some uh, bi-type mica socks and a smiling face sitting next to the deck. Here's our buddy, the bear. Uh, uh, Linda and I call uh, him the, the, the kind bear. Um, he doesn't tear down the feeders. As you can see in this picture, he grasps the feeder gently, pulls it toward his mouth empties the, the grain and leaves it that way. Uh, so it doesn't destroy the feeder. On the deck, relaxing. And we come to the end, but not quite. You, you'll notice that uh, I said that sometimes they're in focus, uh, very few. And here's a picture of a, a cottontail rabbit that was uh, taken at the um, sewage treatment plant a couple of weeks ago. And I think just about everything is in focus. It, it, it almost looks like a Rick Flamati, a Dale Manette, or Jeff Blanchard image. Thank you very much. I've had a good time. Hopefully you did as well. Any questions? Okay, Ernie, let's see what we got here. We got um, a couple comments in the chat that people will enjoy your photos. Um, and uh, both from Joan Deacon, Joanne Deacon and, and uh, Jeff Blanchard. Um, Don and Peg, did you have a question? Um, and Ruth, do you have a question? We really enjoyed the pictures. Thank you so much. Great. Thank, Thank you. you Peg. Yeah. Yeah. If you if people want to write a question, you can write it in the chat. You know. Um, Paul Goyette, did you have a, a thought? See your hand was up. All right. Well, one, of, one of the things I forgot to mention, Dave, is uh, uh, a lesson learned uh, in, in kind of documenting unusual uh, sightings. And that is take the picture first <laughs> and then make the call. Yeah. Uh, I, I mentioned Jeff. Uh, Jeff is, is uh, as I mentioned, a, a a notable birder here. He also happens to be one of the uh, people that seems to find uh, unusual sightings. Uh, I call him the town crier. Uh, he immediately calls, texts uh, all of his uh, friends, birders, that there's a particular sighting uh, and uh, most people try to go and see it. Um, last year, uh, I happened to uh, be uh, in Cassis Meadow behind Rich's Park, I looked over, saw a bird, thought it was a crow, looked at it uh, through in binoculars, realized that it was a uh, common gallinule, which is uncommon here. Uh, I said, oh, oh, oh. I, I fumbled to get my, my, my phone out. I uh, got to call Jeff, got to call Jeff. Uh, got him on the, on, the, on the phone and looked up and I said, oh, it just flew away. 
uh, <laughs> and uh, I didn't get a, an image of it. So now I, I make sure I get an image before I call. And so Ernie, a couple of questions about your, about the camera you're using. Um, you know, it's a bridge camera, but you can explain a little about that and how close you have to be to get an image. Some of those close up images. Um, uh, one of the things, yeah, the, the, one of the things I've found uh, is that um, you can't be too close. It, 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 I found that if you're within um, maybe about eight to 10 feet uh, in general, you can't really focus on uh, on the bird or the the um, uh, whatever you're looking at, uh, you can you can get real close and take a macro of a, of a of a uh, a flower or something. But if you're looking at a bird or a butterfly that's uh, uh, eight six to six to eight feet away, you'll look at it and you can't focus in on it. Um, but um, you know if if a bird's within um, you know 20, 30, 100 feet, 200 feet. Uh, surprisingly, you get some reasonable images, uh, particularly with this 50 power zoom. Um, I've used the camera when I haven't had my um, my uh, scope to, to take an image. Uh, I blow it up to 50 on the camera, and then I can make it even larger when I'm looking at it on the camera, and it's enabled me to identify some things that otherwise I couldn't have uh, using the binoculars. Yeah, and again, Ernie, just a couple of questions about the lens. It's a, it's not a interchangeable lens. These are these cameras have a have a, a zoom lens that's built into the camera that goes to a, a, what they claim to be a fifty x or, but I don't know what it really is. But <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, and, and this they're quite yeah, easy to use too. Yep, this particular yep this particular camera has a Leica lens, so it's a a, a very uh, a quality lens. Uh, one of the things I've noticed with the camera, and, and in all honesty, it was divulged in some of the, um, uh, the reviews of the camera, uh, when you're zooming, it makes a noise. And you'd be amazed at how, how uh, uh, often the birds pick up that noise and flush. Uh, I, I try not to disturb the birds, uh, particularly uh, you know owls and things. I, 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 I'm not interested in getting a good picture. I may take a picture to document it. And a lot of times it's out of focus because it's, it's too far away. But it, it, it's not an interchangeable lens. Uh, I find the, com the camera relatively comfortable. It's not too bulky. It, it kind of can fit in your hands. Uh, I don't have a picture of it, but it would be funny because I've, I've had occasion where I have, I have my tripod with my camera on, on my shoulder. I have my binoculars here and I have the camera here and I'm looking to, to, to find out where the bird is with my binoculars and then I'm trying to find the image or the, the bird in the uh, uh, the viewfinder uh, so it, it can get a little bit uh, funny all right um, I don't see any more questions I appreciate everybody's time um, just a uh, a note for uh, for us that the uh, Jeff Johnstone is still holding his field trips. Um, he's got one this Friday and the next Friday. Um, there should be pretty good migration weather coming up over the next weekend. Um, try to get yourselves out and uh, capture this spring day so that we have coming up. So with that, I think we'll. Oh, uh, Dave, can yeah. I can I get one more plug? Sure. Hey, talking of pictures. Uh, oh, yeah. I'll hold the, I'll hold the key up. It's backwards, but uh, the the uh, Bird Nature Club puts out an annual calendar. Uh, we still probably have about a dozen, dozen and a half calendars. Uh, nice pictures of, of birds taken locally. Uh, I mentioned it for a couple of reasons. Uh, since we're 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 uh, uh, five months into the the year calendar, which normally would would cost ten dollars, we're selling for five. Uh, if you want a copy, uh, I'm going to volunteer Dave's email address, dave at ethelbirdclub.org. And uh, we'll charge you the postage of about a buck 64 and we'll send you a calendar. And more importantly, uh, photos. Uh, the the, the uh, calendar is made up of photos that are submitted by uh, uh, people that have been taken in the North Quabbin area. 
uh, one of the, the biggest issues is finding appropriate pictures for a particular month. So if you have pictures that you think might be suitable for the calendar, uh, again, send them to Dave and we'll evaluate them when we're putting the calendar together. Uh, and send them any time of the year. We'll take them at any time. So you don't have to wait to the end of the year when we're asking for them, you know, because it's really tough to, we have months that, you know, that are kind of tough sometimes, especially some winter birds or winter things or, and, um, but we'll take anything, anything that's natural, you know, whether it be a, a flower or a tree or a bird or a mammal. Um, if it's a nice image, we'll, we'll take it. All right. Uh, any other comments or questions from anybody? I want to thank Ernie for doing uh, this program. Um, I think by fall, we'll be actually getting back into uh, the center, we're hoping. Um, again, I encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Um, it'll just make life so much easier for everybody. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and sign off for the evening and, and thank Ernie for his uh, presentation. and. Thank you all for your patience and time. And uh, let's get out and watch some nature.